All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining the first annual South Dakota Vegetable Short Course in a virtual format. We are so glad you're here. Um, I'd love to take a moment to introduce my co-host, Dr. Rhoda Burroughs. Rhoda, what should folks know about you? Apparently that I can't find my unmute button. <laughs> I'm Rhoda uh, Burroughs. I'm a horticulture extension specialist based out in Rapid City, but I cover the whole state working with fruit and vegetable growers and with produce food safety. Wonderful. Thank you, Rhoda. And for those who don't know me, I'm Christine Lang. I'm an assistant professor and SDSU extension consumer horticulture specialist. I collaborate with Rhoda on vegetable research projects, also manage a cut flower research program, and enjoy working with master gardeners, home gardeners, specialty crop producers across the state of South Dakota. And the goal of this program, uh, or the virtual vegetable short course, it's a four-part series this year, and we want to empower producers to improve and expand their small and medium-scale specialty crop farms. For our gardeners who are in the audience tonight, we're glad you're here, and I hope you are able to learn some things to use in your context as well. And over the next four sessions um, of Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're going to be highlighting SDSU trial results, featuring specialty crop producers from both Iowa and South Dakota as peer educators to share what they've learned from their farm experiences. And we're really excited to highlight research from other Midwest land grant university experts, which is a great segue um, into our first speaker who I'll be introducing. Um, we're gonna have a one hour presentation. And as you think of questions while Dr. Gleason is presenting, please put those questions in the Q and A um, Q&A box so you can type those out and we'll be curating those and addressing as many of those questions as we can during the last half hour of tonight's session. So it's my extreme pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Gleason, who has been a plant pathology professor and extension specialist at Iowa State University for the past 37 years. So all of that to say, this man knows fruit and vegetable diseases. We are in good hands this evening. He's currently leading a three-state OREI-funded project looking into the feasibility of mesotunnels for organic muskmelon and winter squash production. So please join me in a virtual round of applause as we welcome Dr. Mark Gleason to talk about mesotunnels. Do they make sense for organic cucurbits in the upper Midwest? The floor is yours, Mark. Thank you, Christine. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, it's uh, an honor to be invited to participate in this uh, virtual session. I'm really eager to hear your questions about the kind of stuff that we've been doing in, in Iowa and elsewhere. I'm going to try to share the screen now. Let me know if this is working for you, Christine. Can you see that all right? I can see that all right. And if you make those slides full screen, we'll be in good hands. Here we go. All right, looking good? Looks great. I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, let me just shrink this down a bit. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to talk tonight about uh, mesotunnels. This is the term that we made up. As you imagine, that's kind of in an in, in between size tunnel. And do they make sense for organic cucurbits in the upper Midwest? And a major focus here is going to be uh, <clears throat> uh, is going to be these two pest and disease complexes, which uh, we certainly have a problem with in Iowa, and surrounding states, and I assume that you have them in South Dakota too. Over on the left, you see uh, cucumber beetles striped and spotted, and uh, a disease uh, that they are associated with, which is bacterial wilt that causes the cucurbit plant to wilt and die. That's on the left there, the, the bacteria that, that causes the bacterial wilts carried by the beetles. And on the right is another um, situation where the beetle and the bacteria are involved together. And this is a squash bug on squash and the squash carries a bacteria that causes another disease called a, a cucurbit yellow uh, vine disease, CYVD. And that's something that 
30 years ago in the Midwest, we never heard of, but it's becoming more and more common, not only in the Midwest, but from here uh, out to the, the East Coast as well. So we've got uh, on the left, bacterial wilt, uh, and on the right, uh, cucurbit yellow vine disease. And each one of these is very closely associated with the behavior of these insects because they uh, spread the bacteria um, in their bodies and by feeding. Okay, let's see if I can figure out how to advance these slides. <clears throat> here we go. Um, and uh, so here we have a shot. Actually, this wasn't from uh, was wasn't from Iowa on the left, but this is bacterial wilt um, in uh, in New York State and. Um, uh, and then uh, an Iowa shot here on the right uh, the, uh, on, uh, on um, cucumber in Iowa. So this is a fatal disease, this bacterial wilt. Um, you know, it's really kind of heartbreaking because you can get a nice looking crop and then um, in comes this bacteria and, and really takes things down. Then the other one I mentioned, cucurbit yellow vine disease, it's often a late season thing. You'll see the the tips of vines go yellow and they can go bright yellow and then they will collapse and die. Uh, this problem first uh, showed up in, um, in the lower Great Plains in Oklahoma and has become a big deal in the South as well as the East, um, mainly on squash. Uh, life cycle of the, um, of the squash bugs, fairly similar to that of the, um, at least of the striped cucumber beetle in that they both overwinter as adults um, in, our, in our area. And then they emerge in the spring and they're looking for cucurbits to feed on. So what have we got for management? Well, <clears throat> as I say, we've got two pests and two uh, pathogens that they carry. Uh, insecticides are the first line of defense oftentimes. Um, and uh, we can rotate away from cucurbits, which helps a little bit because most of the adult beetles will uh, go into the ground pretty near or in um, an area where the previous crop, uh, cucurbit crop was. Perimeter trap cropping has been tried in various parts of um, the Midwest and East with a, a varying level of success, uh, but also barrier strategies. And this is where um, the tunnels and that sort of thing come in. Our focus, uh, we were working on, orga on organic project. Our, our focus was what about organic management? This is a different world. Organic insecticides are available, but um, these are tough pests to control. It's, it's tough to stop cucumber beetles. It's tough to stop squash bugs, even with synthetic chemical insecticides that are labeled for them. And if you go with the organic insecticides, there's just a whole lot less effective. That, um, the um, barrier strategy uh, seems to be uh, uh, more promising here. We don't really have primitive trap crops uh, here because that, again, re re uh, relies on synthetic chemical insecticides to kill the insects. So let's think about barriers. That's kind of where our research has gone. And um, years ago, we were working a lot with cucurbits and, and low tunnels, which we think of as about 18 inches high. And it's the spun bond polypropylene uh, supported by, uh, by, by those uh, wires. Um, and um, basically that gives you uh, uh, um, protection from transplant until bloom. But uh, once, uh, once you get to bloom, it gets too hot in those tunnels, even for cucurbits, which are pretty warm loving. It just can get 150, 160 degrees, so too hot. Um, so we've got to think about something else um, for the rest of the season. So low tunnels are short term in terms of their protection. They have you know, a lot of early season and season extension values, uh, but uh, to try to carry them through the season, it's really tough. The spun bond polypropylene has many uses and values, but it, um, it does hold heat. Um, you can't spray through it. Um, so it's really limited to that about the three weeks um, in, in our area from transplant until um, the female flowers begin to appear on the cucurbits. So a number of growers in the East had come up with this idea of using a, a, a nylon mesh material 
<clears throat> uh, rather than a spun bond polypropylene. This is this is like a window screen. This, if you look at it really close up, it's it's breathable like the window screen, um, but the mesh is small enough that those insects, like cucumber beetles and squash bugs, can't get through. We call them mesotunnels because um, the way we build them uh, and the way a number of uh, or commercial organic growers have done them before us. Um, they're about three and a half feet high, uh, which is um, larger uh, than, a, than a low tunnel, um, uh, but smaller than like a caterpillar tunnel and certainly smaller than a, a typical high tunnel that we think of. We typically uh, make these uh, mesotunnels in triple rows so that there are three rows under a single piece of this nylon mesh fabric. Uh, here's a good look at that fabric with a squash bug sitting on top, and you can see it's way too large to get through that mesh. Um, and uh, and that, but air can pass easily through. And actually, you can spray through uh, this net as well. Um, just a just a diagram here to show you that uh, that the airflow is pretty pretty good. And uh, even in the middle of June or or uh, or even in July when it's really hot, there's very little temperature difference inside versus outside those tunnels because of the open mesh nature of this material. So good air exchange doesn't overheat. It's also tougher physically than, than spun bond polypropylene and therefore is more likely to be able to last um, uh, longer through a couple of additional growing seasons. Um, spraying through it turns out to be an advantage because if you do have to put it on, let's say in the organic world, an organic insecticide, or on a green organically improved fungi, uh, approved fungicide, you can go right through it. It sprays, uh, the spray passes right easily through it. So the question we were asking uh, is, can we, can we really use this, uh, this netting material for full season protection? Can we establish these mesotunnels at transplant and have them go pretty much until harvest with, um, in, case, in some cases, some interruptions? Uh, but that would be an advantage over the, uh, over the low tunnels, which are only going to take you about three weeks until bloom starts. Uh, so can we get that full season protection? That, that's a question that drove us into our work. Um, but if you cover cucurbits with fabric for most or all of the season, you've got to think about some other things. One, are, one, are, uh, one is bees because you've got to have bees in order to pollinate the crop. This is, uh, cucurbits are 100% pollinator um, uh, driven. That is, you, you've got to have uh, typically bees in there to pollinate. Doesn't have to be um, honeybees, but other bees, uh, bumblebees and, and squash bees are actually better pollinators of cucurbits. So pollination has to be accomplished somehow. And, and you know, when we've got these covers on that, we have to think about how we're going to do that. And the other issue is weed control in the furrow. So uh, we've got black plastic, uh, in the row with the crop, but what about the furrow in between? Um, uh, what what can we do there? Can we can we use a living mulch? Uh, what what can we do that would be would be practical for, in our case, organic growers? Obviously, we don't have herbicides because this is the organic world, and we don't have um, effective chemical herbicides. This was actually a three state project. It's it's finishing up uh, now in the in the next uh, six months or so. Uh, but uh, Iowa was the lead um, on the project and uh, Kentucky and New York Cornell University and University of Kentucky um, uh, did similar studies in their states under somewhat different conditions of uh, pest pressure, uh, different weather regimes, different soil types, and uh, uh, you know, not surprisingly came up with um, somewhat um, different outcomes than, than we did in Iowa. But let's talk about the Iowa um, results. We do have this website, which I, I'll, I'll mention here, the current cucurbit, which has a whole lot of resources actually uh, on it now um, that um, you may find uh, useful podcasts, videos, uh, a grower uh, manual for um, using mesotunnels, uh, a lot of really good stuff on it. Um, and um, you just uh, just type in your browser current cucurbit and it will, it will come up with this website, uh, easy to find. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the performance of um, mesotunnels in our experimental trials. We also work to directly with growers on, on, in on-farm trials, but because of limitation of time tonight, I'm going to talk about, uh, about the, um, 
ones we did on our experimental farm near Ames, Iowa. You can kind of see from this picture how we did these three rows, um, the, uh, the three row uh, mesotunnel and how that, how that setup looked, a uh, large area covered by that, uh, by that nylon mesh fabric. Now I'm gonna talk about four trials. Two of those trials had to do with musk melon and two had to do with acorn squash. And the subject of those trials were, as I suggested before, um, pollination, how we're gonna get that accomplished and um, management of weeds um, in the furrow in between the crop rows. So we have two crops, musk melon and acorn squash, and we have two kinds of trials. Uh, pollination and um, and weed control, and I'll I'll try to keep us uh, straight. Um, try to keep everybody straight as to which trial we're talking about when. So first, the pollination trials, and this is a, a drone's eye view of our um, of our plots, our pollination plots, um, covered by the, um, the the tunnels, say 150 feet long. So we were trying to get up to the length that that uh, would be at least close to what um, some commercial growers would do. We had worked previously with smaller um, plots, but we thought it'd be more realistic trying to get up to, um, to these larger plots that were representative of the real world. Here was the treatments that we used um, for the, those pollination trials uh, on both musk melon and, um, and acorn squash. So let me walk you through there. We had three kinds of treatments on, this, on these pollination trials. We had a so-called full season uh, treatment, an on, off, on treatment, and an open ends treatment. And this uh, diagram kind of explains what we did. If you, if you go from left to right across it, it's kind of the sequence of what happened in time. So in the, in the pre-flowering period after we transplanted and uh, before the flowers started to appear, um, the, the nets were on. Uh, for the full season and basically for the full season they stayed on the whole time so that's why you see this crosshatch the whole season um, even flowering the only time we opened is when we put bees we put a, a box of purchased bees underneath to um, to uh, accomplish pollination uh, and then during the post flowering period uh, before bloom uh, we we're also covered so that full season is, is like the name implies the the nets were in place virtually all the time <clears throat> the other treatment on off on we let nature or natural pollinators do the job during the, uh, during the flowering period. So early season was covered with the nets. Then we pulled the nets off uh, for about uh, 10 days during flowering uh, of the female flowers. And then we replaced the nets um, for the rest of the season. So there was about 10 days in the middle of the season where um, insects, including pollinators, had access. Uh, we did not buy bees in that case. We just let nature do the job of, of um, bringing in bees. Then the open ends treatment uh, was almost kind of a, what you might say, a compromise between the first two treatments. Uh, again, pre-flowering was covered with uh, the mesh material. Then we opened just the ends. We didn't open, uh, didn't pull off the nets entirely. We just opened the ends and hoped that the bees would fly in from the ends and, and do the job in terms of pollination. And then we replaced the nets at the end of that 10 days or so. So the, the treatments again were full season, on, off, on, and open end. So let's see what, what happened there in Iowa with those treatments. Here's what they look like uh, during the bloom period. Uh, on, off, on, which you can see here, now the, uh, the nets are removed. So that's completely exposed for pollinators. Full season is closed and there's a bee box inside there and these long 150 foot long tunnels. Um, and the, <clears throat> pardon me, the, the open ends uh, just had the ends opened and hoping that the bees will fly in and accomplish pollination in that long tunnel. And here we are at harvest, uh, doing things the old fashioned way. Okay, let's look at yield. Uh, first of all, on, on musk melon uh, in these pollination trials. And of course, the thing we're most interested in is the marketable weight, which you see on the left. Um, the, the left graph represents the results from uh, 2020 and uh, the right uh, graph from 2021. The results from 2022 are very similar actually to these two years. The results were really quite consistent in that um, the, um, in, in the case of musk melon, um, the, uh, 
the full season, or it's called one beehive here, but this is the full season, the green had significantly higher yield than the other two treatments, the, the open ends and the on off on. Uh, that was true in 2020 and, and 2021. It was also true in 2022. So uh, putting that beehive underneath and, and uh, allowing the protection to be there, uh, protection against insects to remain in place all season, in the case of muskmelon, uh, gave us the highest marketable yield. As I just said, full season mesotunnels gave the highest marketable yield in, uh, in muskmelon. But not all, these crops are not, uh, musk, the cucurbit crops are not all uh, the same in terms of their outcome, as I'll show you. This is the way we scouted for bee. So we were monitoring bee activity. I had two, two scouts out there uh, during the bloom period um, in the exposed uh, treatments, as well as the ones co still covered by nets, monitoring bee activity in particular sites. Um, uh, and selected uh, hours during the bloom period. One of the interesting outcomes of um, the study, this is data from 2022, um, is from the on-off-on treatment. And this may go a ways to explaining why on-off-on did not have as high a yield as the, um, uh, as the uh, full season, for instance. Um, you'll notice in the, uh, what you're looking at here uh, from left to right, it's called beginning from Z1 to Z10, you're looking at 15 foot zones right across uh, a tunnel from one, begin one end of the tunnel to the other end of the tunnel. And so in the middle here around Z5, you're in the middle of the tunnel. Well, um, you can see what's happening in terms of yield. It's, there's a big dip in the middle of that, of that tunnel. This was also true in, um, in one out of the other two years as well. There was a very definite dip in that, in that, uh, in that center. And we, and we interpret that to be that, that um, basically the bees were not flying in all the way. They were flying in through the open ends in that, in that treatment, but didn't quite make it to the same extent in, in the middle of the, of the trial. So um, that's why we, uh, we think we had a yield dip there. So pollination decreased with distance into the tunnels. It may be that with that on off on, um, I'm sorry, with that uh, open end strategy that, that 150 feet is too long, we'd have to have more openings uh, available than that, than just the ends. Now looking at the same trial, this is pollination again, but now we're switching crops and talking about acorn squash. One of the things we noticed with acorn squash, even though we had relatively low bushing varieties, is they really filled up the mesotunnels uh, fairly, fairly promptly. So there's a lot more vegetation produced in the case of, um, of muskmelon. Um, but again, we had the same treatments, uh, full season, on, off, on, and open ends. And here you see them um, during the pollination period. So let's, think, let's look, at, look at what happened in acorn squash, quite different actually than what happened in, in muskmelon. Here we're looking at all three years, marketable yield in acorn squash. And what you'll notice is that um, the full season doesn't do nearly as well. In fact, the full season underperforms the other treatments in these, in these trials with acorn squash. That's quite different than muskmelon where that was kind of the winner in terms of yield. But here we actually have no consistent differences among the treatments in acorn squash. And if you look at the one place where the red arrow is pointing, uh, we had some questions about whether the, um, whether the, the purchased bees in that full season treatment were really doing their job. And we wondered whether we got a hive, uh, one of these uh, cardboard boxes that you buy from suppliers um, with, with uh, bumblebees in it, whether the hive may not have been um, as healthy as some of the others. So that's just another factor that's that's um, in play when you when you um, have these purchased bees. So and again, really different uh, outcome in acorn squash in these pollination trials uh, compared to muskmelon. Uh, clear the clear winner in the muskmelon was the full season treatment, and uh, there was no clear winner, um, no consistent winner year to year in the acorn squash for that for that pollination trial. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, weed control trials. This is an interesting story. Um, 
again, we're, we're focusing on the furrow, the area in between the black plastic mulched crop rows and, and growers, uh, organic growers that uh, we know and that have been advising us on our project uh, have a variety of strategies to, to deal with um, the growth of weeds in, the, in, these, uh, in these furrows. And uh, one thing that we tried um, that hasn't been tried a lot in our experience um, to date was using this uh, grass called TEFF, T-E-F-F. The scientific name is Agrostis TEFF. It's an ancient cereal grass from uh, Ethiopia, a very dry part of um, Eastern Africa. Um, and uh, it's a very good uh, competitor um, uh, in, uh, in dry periods. So uh, for us in the Midwest and Great Plains where we're prone to drought, um, it may do well. Um, and so we, we, we use that as, um, as a living mulch and we compared that as I'll show you in just a minute to, to other treatments. But we have this big question, right? About should we, should we leave the furrows bare? Should we just let weeds grow in them? Should we have a live mulch? But there are some, there are some pluses for uh, the live mulch. Um, particularly over time in an organic setting, um, you're getting protection against erosion. On the left, you see a lot of erosion happening after a rain and on the right, much less. And with the living mulch, you can incorporate that mulch and, and build soil organic matter uh, and therefore soil health. Um, the other factor you may get if you get a good stand of living mulch is you may get suppression of weeds, particularly in the early season and also um, keeping the weed seed bank uh, under control so that your, your risk of weed outbreaks in subsequent years is, is less. So there are some attractive potential advantages to using living mulch in these furrows. So we thought we would try that. Um, in 2020, in Iowa, our weed control treatments were, as you see here, um, we used uh, as a control the weed fabric. So this is a landscape fabric, the, the one that, with the red circle on it here. And then we planted teff seed at four pounds per acre or eight pounds per acre uh, in the furrow. And then we also had a bigger ground treatment where we didn't do anything, which of course would be the cheapest in terms of, uh, of capital and, and uh, you know, labor and equipment. But um, we thought we'd, uh, some growers do that. We thought, we thought we'd try that. So what we found um, in, um, uh, in 2020 was that there was a real yield drag associated with the TEF. If we had TEF in the furrow, it really pulled down our marketable yield compared to let's say the control, which was the weed fabric that basically suppressed all the weeds. Um, TEF, uh, we, we had very dry year um, in that 2020, uh, and TEF is a wonderful competitor for water. So we, what we think happened is, uh, you're looking at on, on the right here is the TEF root system. It's an amazing root system. And what we think happened is the TEF that we seeded in the furrow, uh, once it germinated and started to grow, it, the roots went straight for the, uh, for the drip tape underneath the crop and, uh, and sucked a lot of water away from the crop. So we had really good weed suppression, but we also had <laughs> crop yield suppression so that uh, we needed to modify our approach. Um, you know, this is a crop that's vigorous or a, a, a living mulch that's vigorous, but how can we keep it from dragging down the crop? So the final year we, we got rid of, or, or the next year we got rid of uh, the higher rate of TEF and just went with four pounds. And this was the five treatments we had um, in, uh, in 2021 20, uh, and 2022. Uh, again, the weed fabric control. Um, and then we had um, a TEF that was not mowed and TEF that was mowed. Um, uh, we'd mowed uh, once uh, uh, during the flowering period for the crop. Uh, and then we had a non-mowed bare ground trial, uh, furrow uh, and um, mowed bare ground to compare um, the bare ground with the uh, TEF. So those five treatments, um, what we're trying to do here, what we were trying to do here is to see whether we could tame down this wild beast, this, this TEF, who was uh, in a, doing a great job of producing a lot of above ground biomass, but the below ground biomass was, was stealing our yield. So can we get the weed suppression and uh, kind of have our cake and eat it too, get the weed suppression, but not have a, a yield drag associated with that um, uh, growth. So the idea would be to suppress the, the TEF growth uh, once the early season is over. 
So how did this come out? If we look at muskmelon weed control in those two years, 2021, 2022, 2021 on the left, 2022 on the right, um, what we see is that um, mowing the TEF, you look at those bottom labels, mowing the TEF um, made a huge difference in terms of yield. Just mowing that TEF once during that um, the crop bloom period um, essentially erased, or statistically at least erased, the, uh, the yield drag that we were getting with, um, uh, without mowing. And pretty much the same trend in, in 2022, the highest uh, yield again was the weed fabric, but we had no statistical difference um, with, the, uh, with the mowed TEF. Again, mowing the TEF um, made a huge difference in terms of, uh, of um, cutting down on the yield drag. So basically mowing TEF at bloom statistically eliminated the, um, the yield drag. Same trial, but this is on acorn squash. Uh, and without um, going into uh, extraordinary detail, I'll just give you the bottom line that, again, mowing TEF reduced the yield drag on acorn squash. So we still haven't optimized or found out what the perfect time is or the optimal time is to, to mow that uh, TEF, uh, but it, it certainly did a wonderful job protecting against early season weeds. And, and once we mowed it, uh, it didn't come back nearly as strongly after that mowing. And this, by the way, does not survive the winter. This TEF doesn't survive the winter, doesn't, therefore doesn't produce uh, seed in our part of the world. <clears throat> so based on our three years of work um, with the weed control, with TEF, we, our recommendations were, um, for one thing, uh, TEF's a tough grass, but it, it's a little bit of a baby at the beginning of the year and, and uh, beginning after you seed it. So you have to give it a little water or get some some rain, um, a decent rain uh, after um, you, you seed it uh, in order to get it going. Once it gets going, it's, it's uh, incredibly vigorous. <clears throat> and so when you mow at bloom, mow to two to four inches, uh, what we found and the Kentuckians uh, uh, were ahead of us on this, uh, the best mower for this kind of uh, uh, a plot was a flail mower on a, a, mounted on a BCS tractor. <clears throat> that gave us, uh, I think they were able, what, you're not seeing this in the picture here, but this is what they found. Um, this, is a, this is kind of a jack leg mower that we developed at Iowa State, but the, the flail mower worked better. And you can basically do most of your mowing in a single pass in the six foot spacing that we're using between rows. And that was a lot more efficient. To summarize the Iowa field trials that I've mentioned uh, here, um, the, the two kinds of trials again were to look at pollination as, uh, uh, strategies and look at weed control strategies. And uh, for pollination, um, the full season treatment, that is where we had the bees underneath, uh, had, the, had the highest marketable yield. Uh, for acorn squash, there were no consistent treatment uh, differences. <clears throat> for weed control trials, on the other hand, um, both muskmelon and squash had similar results in that mowing uh, TEF, seeding TEF in the furrow um, uh, at, at a fairly low rate, four pounds per acre, um, but mowing it uh, during the crop bloom period eliminated or reduced the yield drag on the, on the crop. So we got our, our living mulch, we got our weed control and uh, uh, minimal suppression, if any, of yield. So take home messages from this aspect, from, from these experimental trials, uh, at Iowa State University, um, <clears throat> we think that mesotunnels have, have good, really good potential for organic muskmelon production uh, in the upper Midwest. We're still working on the economics there, but it looks promising. I think there's less potential for acorn squash um, uh, production in terms of uh, value per acre. Um, that, that part of it uh, wasn't as encouraging, I think, uh, but the, uh, but the, mes the um, uh, Organic muskmelon was uh, much more encouraging. Um, we also know from our trials between New York and, <clears throat> and pardon me, uh, Kentucky is that, uh, and, and Iowa is that results varied with the geographic region. They didn't get the same outcome in, in Kentucky and New York that, that, that we did. But the, the consistency of our results made, made us think that they'd be a pretty good predictor for the upper Midwest and, and uh, upper Great Plains. <clears throat> in the future, I think the work that needs to be done is to extend these 
this kind of technology to, to other crops because it is one of the barrier or protection kind of technologies that uh, in future climates, we're probably gonna need more protection than we've had until now. And um, uh, also looking at the possibility of, of doing multiple mesotunnel crops in the same season to get more value out of that, um, uh, out of that mesh material. We have developed a, a grower's manual that's on our website um, that has got all the practical stuff in it, basically all the how-tos and tips and tricks that we have learned in three years in, in our three states. And also that our growers have, um, have given us advice uh, based on their experience with, um, with this mesotunnel approach. <clears throat> And of course, uh, the crews uh, are, 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 are essential to all this. Uh, um, these are a number of, year, of our crews at, uh, at Iowa State uh, over the years to, who actually did the work. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I, I did want to make you aware again of this project website, www.drcurbit.plantpath.iastate.edu. Um, uh, and uh, so that's something that, that's really worth going to and looking at. Um, uh, a lot of good resources there to, to sort of deepen what I've presented this evening. Our funding source was USDA NIFA, the uh, OREI program, and uh, the context for the project, uh, me in Iowa and Kentucky, it's Dr. David Gonthier, who's an entomologist, and there's his email address. And in New York, it's Dr. Sarah Pethybridge, a pathologist, and, and her email is as, as shown uh, there. With that, Christine, I think I uh, will stop sharing and be happy to take any questions. All right, awesome. Yep, Rhoda and I will jump in and we'll start sending some questions your way. Um, before we do that, just wanna apologize for folks if you were like, the chat is disabled, but we did have one person drop in the Q&A. We have someone tuning in from <laughs> North Pole, Alaska, who's gonna be moving to South Dakota soon. So Whoa. I- I'd say you get the award for um, attendee from furthest away. <laughs> <laughs> or minus 20 shouldn't bother them at all. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think we're going to start with questions that came in at the beginning so we can kind of work through the presentation. But there was a clarifying question mark on where did the squash bugs overwinter? Well, you're talking to a pathologist here, but I'll tell you what the entomologists <laughs> tell me. Uh, and that is that the adults overwinter in a shallow layer of the soil. They're either under, under debris, you know, like organic debris and, and, and right at the soil surface or just an inch or less deep in the soil. And that's very much like what striped cucumber beetles do. And they tend to preferentially overwinter near fields, cucurbit fields from last year, if, they, if the populations have built up. That's a major rationale for rotating farther away, the better. And that sets us up. So someone wanted some clarification on crop rotation or physical movement. Will that help with these pests or are the pests simply gonna move with the crops? Well, you know, it depends on scale. If, if, you're, if your entire field is, uh, is an acre and you're moving your, 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 your subfields around within an acre, Rotation probably isn't going to have the same impact as it would if, if you were dealing with, you know, 10 acres or 30 acres or 50 acres where you, where you have the ability to move farther away. These are flying insects. They are mobile. They don't just crawl. Um, and so they can go, you know, hundreds of yards. They tend to stay uh, local, but they, they can go some distance. So if you're, if you're in a sort of a large commercial garden situation, but that might only be half an acre, a quarter of an acre. Um, the rotation is probably going to do as much for you, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had um, we had acorn squash in the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, for our research fields this year. And um, the squash bugs, the cucumber beetles, they all found us. And it had been several years since anything had been there. <laughs> that proves that if you if you build it, they will come. They will. <laughs> so. Mark, we had someone who was really curious about trap cropping. Could you give a better definition or explanation of yeah. how that works? Yeah, you can read online about it, but um, we tried it for a while in Iowa. Um, I think it's pretty circumstantial. So imagine a field of um, um, one kind of cucurbit, let's say butternut squash. That's your main crop. And around that field, you have a double row 
of another kind of cucurbit crop. And that other kind of cucurbit crop is highly attractive, more attractive than the main crop to cucumber beetles. So the cucumber beetles have a tendency to go to particular cucurbit crops that they like a lot. So if you've got like a buttercup squash, they love it, right? So they will go to those two rows and you then you would put on an insecticide spray focused on those two rows, not, not, your, um, not your main crop. So if, if, you're, if your main crop is five acres and you only have two rows around the edge that are, that are buttercup squash and, you, and your butternut in the middle, which is less preferred by cucumber beetles, um, has, doesn't have cucumber beetles, then you can just spray your outer rows and take care of most of your cucumber beetles. And you can save... You can read in New England uh, where butternut squash has grown a lot. You can read that uh, using conventional insecticides, they save 90% of their sprays by using this perimeter trap crop, using something like Hubbard squash or buttercup squash as the perimeter around that. The, the disadvantage is you've got to maintain two crops and, they're, and they behave differently. Harvest is different, cultivation is different, pests are different. So we tried it with musk melon in Iowa uh, for over a three year project. Um, but it turned out for us that musk melon is just too darn attractive to cucumber beetles. And even though we had conventional insecticides, um, it wasn't consistently effective strategy. And, and with that additional disadvantage of managing two crops in the same field, we didn't really recommend it. Um, so we've kind of, and, and since the recent work we've done is organic work, the, the perimeter trap cropping doesn't, there's not much evidence that it works when you're working with weaker insecticides like the organic growers. That's all they have to work with is chemicals are, are there, but they're relatively uh, weak against these very robust insects. Excellent. Thank you for sharing those insights. So we have a question for a grower or someone who's maybe not as familiar with scouting. When you walk out into a field, how do you know the difference between squash vine borer symptoms and bacterial wilt symptoms as you look out over that field? And okay. then what would you do next? <laughs> All, right. All right, now there's an insect that we haven't really talked about, which is squash vine borer, um, which is um, one, one we certainly fight in Iowa as well. Squash vine borer is tricky. Um, well, and I see a pumpkin field, right? And I see scattered, plants that are starting to go yellow or brown. Um, I'm looking at the base of the plant because squash vine borers will bore in right at the base or even just a little bit, half an inch below, an inch below the surface of the ground. So you wanna excavate with your fingers just around the, the base of the, of the main stem there. That's where they go in. And it's a pretty, it's a very unsubtle borer. It's a gross, fat, white, slimy item. You can't mistake it for anything else. So squash vine borer, the barrier strategies like low tunnels, meso tunnels uh, should certainly help as well with, um, with squash vine borer. We didn't have as consistent a pressure on squash vine borer. So we focused our efforts mainly on the, uh, the cucumber beetles and the squash bugs and the, and the bacterial diseases they carry. The squash vine borer is a huge problem as, as well. Um, but the bigger question that your questioner was asking, I think, is how to recognize these things in the field one from another. So how do I know if I've got bacterial wilt? How do I know if I've got cucurbit yellow vine disease? Um, the more you look at them, the more confident you get at seeing them. Hopefully you don't get see them enough to get really confident. But um, Funny thing about bacterial wilt, it's not a big deal on squash in our part of the world. If you, if you, if you think about acorn squash or butternut squash, they worry a lot about bacterial wilt in the east. We don't have the strains in the Midwest, upper Midwest, we don't have those strains yet at least that, uh, that, that are able to cause bacterial wilt on, on squash. We certainly do on musk melon and cucumber and honeydew that's where we have our big problems with bacterial wilt. If you go to New York State or Massachusetts and places like that, um, bacterial wilt will take down squash, it will take down musk melon, it will take down practically anything cucurbit except watermelon, which pretty much is immune. Um, I'm still on this subject of how to determine between them. Okay, 
cucurbit yellow vine disease is new to a lot of growers. They haven't seen it, but it's typically a late season thing. And typically the yellowing is happening on the, and, and the vine tips. So, you know, three weeks before harvest, two weeks before harvest, you're seeing this, this yellowing and sometimes followed by collapse. It can be quite calamitous. Um, and it's often associated with the presence of squash bugs because they, they carry it. Cucumber beetles don't carry it, right? The, the bacteria called serratia marchescens that causes CYVD is, is just carried by squash bugs. And the one that causes bacterial wilt just carried by cucumber beetles. As far as recognizing bacterial wilt in the field, it gets a little trickier. I would say if you know a, an extension person that you can dig up a plant and send it to him or her for confirmation, that's probably the best way. Uh, I would say the same thing for if you have never seen CYVD before, I, I'd say send it in. Take a, you know, a starting point would be to take pictures and, and uh, you know, rely on the, the trained people to, to get you started there with the, with the identification because it, it's, it's important to know what you've got. You know, if that's a problem, you want to be able to pinpoint and therefore what you might do about it. And that's a perfect advertisement for everyone who's listening. If you're in South Dakota, we do have our plant diagnostic clinic. And I will drop the, their website in the chat. And you'll see I'm dropping a few resources in the chat as we go along here. Um, but we do have diagnosticians who can accept whole plant samples for a small fee and help you figure out what in the world is going on. So Mark, we have a few questions now about the tunnels themselves. So is the nylon resistant to hail damage? Well, that's a really good question. And I would give you a very extension answer. It depends. I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be resistant to softball size hail, but let's just say, let's talk about dime size hail, for instance. You can get a lot of protection. I've seen this. You can get a lot of protection from um, this uh, nylon mesh material uh, from say dime size hail that might otherwise do a fair amount of damage to the crop. Um, so you do get some, you do get some protection from hail, but, you know, biblical hail, you know, giant stuff like you guys get out there in the Dakotas, um, no, <laughs> probably the tunnels won't take that. All right. I appreciate the honesty. So this is an interesting question because you talked about the ability to spray, you know, through the, through the mesotunnel, um, you know, covering. So um, someone is wondering, does it hold and carry over the spray to the next use? Is there any concerns with that? Yeah, that's a good question. And we've asked that ourselves. Um, you know, is, it, is there a residue on the material? And I, I would never handle this material uh, without gloves on. I mean, it's not, it's not a dangerous material per se, but just like it wouldn't handle any kind of used material. I think storage is an issue and that growers have to think about Okay, if I if I'm going to reuse this stuff in another year, I can't just uh, pile it in the corner because uh, mice are very busy and they they don't have Netflix and uh, they have all winter to turn your turn your net into um, something that looks like Swiss cheese. So to discourage that, uh, they should go in barrels or they should be hung from the rafters, someplace that mice won't go or that you know mice aren't going to be uh, because they are. They are, they, I think they get bored, you know, and they have to work on their teeth. And, <laughs> and so um, this is just something to eat, just like the wires of your car in the garage, you know, they like those too. Yeah, they, they also like nesting in controller boxes for high tunnels. I learned that the hard way when I was in Iowa, so. <laughs> yeah, so they see the world differently than we do and different opportunities. They, they uh, do. But, <laughs> but, um, but um, that's a really good question. And it leads me into thinking about, um, you know, how can we, how can we extend the life of these things beyond one year? This net is not cheap, right? You're talking about two and a half times the cost of, of spun bond polypropylene. So these nets, you've got to get more than one year out of them. And we have done that, but we've also done a little bit of repair. So um, for instance, uh, in the spring, we'll take them out of their, you know, 55 gallon drums or whatever, pull them out and, and we'll, we'll, we'll put them up, uh, you know, put the, uh, put the sandbags on them to put them tight around the edges. Uh, and then we'll look for the holes and we, we'll just take a 50 pound test fishing line and go around and just, uh, this stuff is very repairable. It's tough enough to repair without tearing. So you just, um, you can do this fairly quickly. Uh, there are ways that, um, you know, it can tear 
uh, we started out with bags of rocks holding down the nets, but we gave that up because the rocks were a little sharp and wind would push on the nets and pull on the nets. And uh, it turned out that sand was a lot better. There's a lot less uh, sharp edges in, in you know, uh, sand. Um, and you can, you can use these uh, UV uh, resistant sandbags that will last you, you know, three, four years or more without breaking. So that, that part is, is, um, is pretty durable. But we, th we think this netting with, with, with careful use can go three years. That's not counting a hundred mile an hour windstorm or you know, hail the size of your head. You know, that's a different story. Excellent. And if you wanna get into soil tarping, you'd have multiple uses for those sandbags. So something else to think about, but that's sure. a project Rhoda and I are gonna be starting this year. So we'll have more about that next winter. <laughs> yeah. You know, we even started out, Christine, and some growers uh, that use low tunnels have done this where they bury the edges yeah. of those, uh, of those uh, fabrics. But that's a lot of work, and it's, and it's really tough to get it up, too. Unless you have the proper machinery, it's, it's tough to pull that up. Sandbags and generally are, are, are easier. Uh, mm -hmm. You might have noticed in the pollination trial, we had the landscape fabric as one weed control trial. And that works really well, but then you have all these staples to deal with. <laughs> Pulling those up, and if you miss one, then guarantee a mower will find that one. And it's not, they're not very kind to mower blades, um, those metal staples. So that's just another thing to think about. Um, yeah. There are growers who, for one reason or another, prefer using the landscape fabric, sometimes as a single sheet over a field. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just depends on circumstances. Yep. And we're going to be talking more about landscape fabric use next Thursday because we have a project that includes some of it. So yes, I know my graduate student is in the audience giggling about staples right now. <laughs> so uh, one, of those, one, of, one of those realities of life, you know, it's hard to deal without the staples. If you don't use the staples, then the wind is going to pick up your fabric. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, we don't, have, we don't have to explain in Iowa, we don't have to explain to people in South Dakota about wind. Do you understand? So, you know, wind yep. We we would argue it's worse, but <laughs> so we've got lots of great questions. So thank you, everybody. Um, the next one is: What is the cost effectiveness of purchasing bees um, for each 150 foot row of musk melons? And I think that's a great question. <laughs> it is a great question, and uh, we have economists on this project, and they're finishing up their economic analysis now, and. This is the key question, right? Can I make money with a mesotunnel system? Fundamental question, right? Um, not, not just can I grow more yield, but can I, can I make money? And uh, we're very close to uh, determination. I think in the, in the Iowa data uh, with muskmelon, we probably have the most encouraging situation uh, that at least some of the trials like the full season, I wouldn't be surprised if that, uh, my intuition is that'll probably um, go on the favorable economic side. Um, not, a, not every year is the same. And anybody who's, who's dealt with cucumber beetles um, knows, or squash bugs knows that some years are bad years, some years are not bad years. You can't count on an intensity of pressure each year. So the real question is over time, and we had three years of data, over time, um, what pays the best? And then, then there's another way to think about this too, Christine. Um, suppose you're an organic grower who's contracted with, um, a group of supermarkets to deliver a certain amount of organic muskmelon, let's say. Um, our opinion is that um, we can get greater consistency of marketable yield with the tunnels. Um, and that may matter if, if a grocery store is expecting so many lugs of fruit um, uh, consistently, um, that may help uh, growers who are trying to uh, deal with that kind of contract rather than, let's say, direct marketing. All right. So we have a clarifying question for you. Is the acorn squash as dependent on pollinators as some of the other cucurbits? It's 100 percent. It's a good question. 100 percent dependent on, on um, insect pollinators, primarily bees. Um, let me say something about acorn squash and, and, and mesotunnels though. They, these, these squash fill up the tunnels and, and um, you know, it's hard to think like a bee, right? But imaginarily we, we do it and we do some monitoring of bee activity and there's so much foliage in there that 
it seems logical that it might be difficult for bees to find all the flowers or to find mm -hmm. the same number of flowers. That's not true in muskmelon. If you're at three and a half foot high tunnel with muskmelon, you still have a lot of airspace in there for bees to fly. But in the case of um, in the case of uh, acorn squash during during the bloom period, you're almost 100% full in those tunnels. So that that's one reason that we we're not particularly encouraged about growing that crop um, in that in that size tunnel. Perhaps taller tunnels. Um, I don't know. But then you have the issue of wind as well. One thing you could say about the nylon mesh, it's it's more tolerant of wind than mm -hmm. the, than the spun bond. Sp spun bond besides being a weaker material, it also um, picks up the wind more like a sail. Whereas yeah. in, the case of, in the case of this nylon screen-like material, the, the, the air largely passes through. But like yeah. I say, at some point, 100 miles an hour, as we had one year, um, you know, you'll see some, some wind injury. Yep. Um, as someone who has helped install both types of material, both the classic row covers as well as the protect net, um, I would agree with that statement about ease of install. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I think our, our most of our encouragement uh, here in Iowa, I think, is uh, is on the uh, muskmelon side. But we'll have more definitive economic data in the next few months as we go to um, publish that and, and share it with growers as well. Awesome. So we have a couple of questions with TEF. So I'm going to just kind of lump these together. So um, people wanting to understand the planting methods for the TEF and how you broadcast or seeded that. And yeah. then someone else was curious, um, would there have been anything with the beetles hanging out more in the TEF outside of the row covers? Would that have created any issues? Hmm. Creating some that's habitat, a, that's I guess. An, that's an interesting one. Uh, seeding was done with a Gandhi uh, uh, a spreader. Um, this is really more in the area of horticulture and, and Ajay uh, Nair, your former mentor, mm -hmm. advised us here as to how to do this and, and uh, you want good contact. So, mm -hmm. you know, ideally um, that after the seeding, you can roll it to, to get good contact between the soil, but you're not burying the seed. You just uh, seed soil contact that you want to be good. But I, I can't emphasize enough that it's important to have some water early in the um, in that that life. You you can do the seeding um, at the same time that you do the transplanting, but um, uh, somehow there's got to be water there, or that tep is going to um, <clears throat> it won't die, but it's going to be disadvantaged. You don't need water for long. Once those seeds once those seedlings get above ground, you have a fierce competitor uh, for for water. So uh, they make a wonderful stand. They suppress weeds really well. Uh, as far as beetles being in the TEF, um, we have not noticed that, that they are particularly uh, even drawn to the TEF. Um, and we tend to grow it just in the furrow. So essentially it, it's completely enclosed by the, by the nets, um, at least in some of those treatments. <clears throat> so I would say no, the beetles, becoming a refuge for beetles is probably not a problem. T TEF to me is like a wild horse. It's gotta be, it's gotta be tamed. You know, if wild horse is interesting, but you don't wanna be kicked in the face, right? So TEF, then that's what the mowing is about. The timing of the mowing, the height of the mowing, some kind of mower that's efficient, like the BCS we talked about, the, the flail mower on a BCS tractor that, you know, hopefully you can get that mowing done in, in essentially one pass. And, um, you know, if you've got a 500 foot long tunnel, uh, it's really important that you do that efficiently. Yeah. And for folks just to, you know, for anyone who has seeded a lawn and used teeny tiny grass seed, TEF seed's about the same size. So it is very small. Um, I've had one successful experience hand scattering it just along some small research plot edges and raking it in. But yes, the, the watering was critical. I would second that. <laughs> and, and, you know, the Kentuckians uh, that we collaborate with have worked with it longer than we have, and they they will use it. Uh, they have used it a number of times as a um, as a uh, what would you call it, like a fallow crop, where they're you know they're not selling the the the, the taff, but they're they're essentially using it for incorporation of, of green material uh, mm -hmm. to, to build up the organic matter in the soil. That's not as much of an issue in Iowa soils, but um, if you go further south, it becomes more and more of an issue um, to build up that organic matter and. Um, often that's what distinguishes organic farms from non-organic is that is that attention to, to the organic matter. Yeah, definitely. 
So another clarifying question as we think back to your trial results, um, did you see bacterial wilt with any of the three trials, the full season net, the open-ended net, and the on-off net? Yeah, and it's kind of like you'd expect. We saw the most with the with the on off on because that was the more exposed because you had essentially 100% of the crop exposed for, for two weeks. Um, in the years where we had uh, significant bacterial wilt, we, uh, we had less in the open ends and it was primarily concentrated at the ends where not only pollinators had access, but also cucumber beetles. Um, we had essentially no bacterial wilt in the full season treatment because we had no cucumber beetles in there. Mm -hmm. So the thing about, thing about bacterial wilt and, and any bacterial disease is it's sporadic. And so, you know, some years you have it severe, some years you don't. And that's why I was talking earlier about the um, importance to at least some growers of, of having consistent marketable yield. Um, one thing you gain from a tunnel, despite it's the effort uh, involved with it, um, is consistency of yield. And if that matters, then that, that may be a technology to look at. All right, thank you. I was catching up on questions to see where we were at. So Mark, I know you talked about, you know, economic analysis is still ongoing. Yep. Is there any sort of a rough cost per acre for materials that you'd feel comfortable sharing? People are very curious about that. <laughs> yeah, we, we have the cost side down. The part we don't have is the what, what, what the economists call the cost efficiency ratio. In other okay. words, for each additional dollar that I spend in cost, what do I get back in terms of, 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 uh, of benefit or, 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 or revenue? Um, and so that's where the comparisons get interesting because then you have the revenue side as well. Um, Ajay just gave us some figures, uh, average figures for values um, in the marketplace of both wholesale and, uh, and retail uh, acorn squash and muskmelon. So we're gonna plug those into that model. I don't have the cost figures off the top of my head, Christine. Um, I can send them to you, um, uh, our, our economists, uh, are right now located at Cornell and one in Beijing. Um, so <laughs> she, she moved, she graduated and moved back to China. Um, but those, um, those economists are very close to sort of a final determination for us and um, they're, they're plugging in the figures now. So they'll be on our website. I'm happy to share them with you when we have them, but it'll be sometime this spring. Okay. And so we should all stay tuned and watch for the next blog post and resource post on the website. Yeah. And the other thing to think about here is labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if it's a mom and pop operation that you have, or, or one person's doing the labor, um, you know, these are, there's two, there's two periods that are really laborious. Uh, one, of course, is harvest. Uh, and, but the other is setup. Uh, well, setup and takedown, right? Because you've got, uh, you've got conduit. These are, these are electrical conduit that are 10 foot sections that are bent in hoops. Um, and uh, that, they last a long time, but they have to be stored somewhere and they have to be taken out of the field. And, you know, there's a certain amount of labor there that, that um, is, you know, certainly cost, cost covers part of the issue, but then also do you have the labor to, to handle this fair, fairly labor intensive approach to what's essentially a, an annual tunnel? Yeah. So I think this is one you might be able to weigh in. If people wanted to look into purchasing this material for their farms, where are some spots that they might be able to purchase it? Well, we, we bought ours from a company in Canada called Dubois, D-U-B-O-I-S, Dubois Agra Innovation, D-U-B-O-I-S, Dubois Agra Innovation. Uh, they're in Quebec and uh, we've, we've dealt directly with them for this material called ProtectNet. There's another, and there's some variations on that. There's another one called ExcludeNet, which um, uh, can price out a little cheaper, but in our experience, the protect net's a little tougher. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's different weights of this material, which, you know, is, is the, the mesh size, um, partly. Um, and I uh, thought so we were using 60 gram material, 60 gram mesh that was, as I showed in the pictures, was small enough to eliminate those fairly large insects. I'm not saying that aphid nymphs won't get through that, it will. I mean, it's not that it's not that small, but um, we haven't been bothered terribly by aphids in New York State. They they fight them a little bit more uh, than we do. Uh, 
but that hasn't been a problem for, for us. And again, you can spray through this stuff if you need to knock down aphids, which are a little easier to kill than, than beetles and, uh, and squash bugs. And that's a great segue because we did have someone circling back on the spray question. Um, you know, if you're covering multiple rows, how is your team reaching the middle? You know, how are you ensuring adequate coverage with spray? We're using, well, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this, right? A lot mm -hmm. of different spray rigs, but uh, we're, we use a, uh, a uh, hydraulic uh, 50 psi uh, sprayer, no, no, no hand spray. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna get to the middle of a of a three row plot, uh, you know you you've got to have a fair amount of pressure there. So um, we have a hand boom, and uh, we'll um, walk in between those three row plots and spray one side, and come down and spray the other side of that three row plot. And we we get pretty good coverage there. You have to think about other. I mean, depending on where you are. For instance, in, in New York, um, uh, powdery mildew is a big concern. Um, they've had uh, some pretty impressive outbreaks of, of powdery mildew and also sometimes downy mildew. We don't have as much of that in the upper Midwest and Great Plains, but there they, they do have more. And <clears throat> sometimes that's their number one problem. But again, you can put copper on uh, mm -hmm. if, you get, if you get the outbreak early enough, uh, but, but coverage is really important. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna fight powdery mildew, you've gotta get coverage uh, both sides of the leaf. And and, um, and you know very thoroughly, so you got to have a, a pressure enough pressure to get through that. I don't I don't think a, a hand pack a hand um, hand pump backpack sprayer is going to cut it if you're talking about any scale at all. Yeah. So you touched on organic pesticides. Um, so are there a couple of organic pesticides you would recommend that are fighting the beetles? And I know you talked about they're not as tough as in terms of knockdown, but you know, what are you using for spray yeah, applications? Well, I mean, we're, you know, things like neem and pyganic, there, there's mm -hmm. not a long list, but they have to be approved by uh, Organic Materials Research Institute or OMRI mm -hmm. um, to be accepted by the National Organic Program. Um, those are two that come to mind. They're not cheap, um, but they are more effective against certain insects than they are against, for instance, the fairly well armored insects that we're dealing with, the squash bug and the cucumber beetles. Yeah, excellent. So I've had two different people who are curious, what about using these mesotunnels for other crops, cabbage, broccoli, lettuce, spinach, things like that? that that's a really good question, um, Christine. And, and I would sort of say it's a horticulturist question. Um, we've asked Ajay about that, and Ajay himself is, is curious about that, and probably you are too. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a trade-off. Um, if you're thinking about season extension on either end, spring or fall extension, this isn't going to be your best material because it doesn't give you a lot of thermal protection, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it's so porous. It's, it's great for that summertime period, but... Um, can other crops be used? Can can you know cruc crucifer crops be used in there? You know, other there's a number of growers in Iowa that are working with this. They're they're, they're trying to get essentially more bang for the same you know tunnel. I, I wouldn't recommend leaving this tunnel material out over the winter, but you could, for instance, uh, I mean it's conceivable that you could leave the hoops up and then re-establish re the tunnels next year with a different kind of crop. But I wouldn't go cucurbits after cucurbits. That's that's yeah. playing with fire. Generally, you want to stay away from that kind of behavior. Yeah. Well, and I can, I wanted to give you the chance to answer it first. I know when I was at Iowa State, we did do some trials with using a traditional row cover, like an agrabon type material versus the protect net over broccoli um, for summer pest management. And one of the questions of interest was the heat underneath those row covers. And what we found is underneath the protect net in general, again, these are generalities, and this is several years ago, so this is as memory serves, um, you didn't have as much heat buildup under those protect net tunnels, which is a good thing because we don't want that broccoli to bolt. Yeah. So that's a general statement of what I observed in my time with that trial. So. Um, I know there is a field research report from Iowa State on the broccoli, I believe, that people can pull up. So um, if you want more information on broccoli performance, you should be able to find it through Iowa State. Yeah, but again, and, and, I think yeah. a lot of cool opportunities. <laughs> yeah, I think a, an opportunity, you know, might depend on whether your crop is 
more at risk from high temperatures or low temperatures. You know, mm -hmm. broccoli yeah. is, extreme, is extremely cool temperature tolerant as opposed to, let's say, some solanaceae or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I would say talk to your extension horticulturist. Uh, mm -hmm. He or she knows um, most about that. Don't bother with the pest people. We, we concentrate on other things. <laughs> So we did have a clarifying question. Folks were wondering, um, has kale and clay been used in your projects? Yeah, good question. Kale and clay will go right through this material, right through the, um, you know, the protectin type material, the nylon mesh. Uh, you, you can put it on, that's an answer, but we haven't used it a lot. Um, we haven't felt that it was terribly effective against squash bugs or, or cucumber beetles. So we haven't used it a lot. Um, it's also hard on sprayer nozzles. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty corrosive stuff, uh, just because there's so much material in it. You know, you're, you're spraying on a lot of sort of bits of solids, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a question that I'd like to just quickly address and Mark, if you have more to say about this, someone was curious about using, you know, a fabric like pool, which you could find in a craft store. Like, would that work as a row cover? My two cents is that material is really flimsy, um, you know, in a small, small scale where you're really protected from the wind, it might work for a season. Um, large scale use out in an open setting, I'd be very hesitant to try it. And what, Mark, what, do you have I'm, any? I'm, I'm sorry, what, what material is this you're talking about? Cool. Um, it's kind of meshy, think like wedding veil. Oh, that kind of stuff. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. My guess is it wouldn't price out. I mean, when you're yeah, because it's also being that, sold for wedding use, so it's yeah, overpriced. We're talking to about thousands it. of yards uh, that you <laughs> in, the, in a commercial setting. I think it's better, um, you know, in a church uh, during a wedding. Yep. <laughs> no, no offense. I mean, it's an interesting question, but you're yeah. talking about a rather similar material. But I think the pricing would, would discourage you, uh, yep. and probably also the durability. Yep. Yep. So um, this is a cool question. Were there any soil fertility things looked at with this trial or considered? Well, certainly we, because it's an organic project, we had to use um, organic fertilizer. And so we had to do soil testing and so forth. Um, an interesting takeoff on that question is, for instance, uh, let's say you use TEF routinely. Well, it has an enormous amount of uh, above ground as well as below ground biomass. Um, would there be issues uh, with uh, carbon nitrogen imbalances? Uh, uh, would that make a difference as to what crop you wanted to put on there in a future year? Um, a lot of people struggle to get enough organic matter in their soil. It's not such an issue in Iowa, but elsewhere it is a real struggle. And um, that's why it has gained popularity in places like um, Kentucky, for instance, where they're perpetually short and you know, their soils are highly mineral. Um, building up organic matter is really important for, for the quality of the soil. <clears throat> Would you want to use um, TEF, you know, routinely for all your fallow fields to build up, um, uh, you know, green manure type approach? Frankly, I, I think the database is too small right now, Christine. Uh, <laughs> growers, as usual, are ahead of the academics. You know, they're, they're experimenting yeah. with things, uh, but so we borrow often ideas from growers. Yeah, we're just trying to keep up with all of you in the audience. Exactly, exactly. You know, the innovators so, are the people on the farms. So as we're winding down, I, I wanted to save this question for last. So Mark, from your perspective as a pathologist, what are three pieces of advice that you'd have for farmers in the Midwest? Ooh, are we talking cucurbits now? We can narrow it down to cucurbits, or if you have three big picture things that I want farmers and gardeners to know this from a pathology perspective, um, I'll leave it open-ended. That's up to you. <laughs> okay. All right. So we could, we could approach this from a perspective where we're organic, but let's just talk about general. Um, I, guess, I, I guess I'd start with soil quality, which is exactly where organic growers start. Yeah. Soil quality helps a lot. A vigorous crop um, is less likely. Not, not, not that it can't be, but less likely to suffer severe damage. Um, so soil quality one, rotation two, um, variety selection three. 
you've got awesome. the ability, if you've got the ability, for instance, in cucurbits to grow varieties that the market will accept that, um, that are powdery mildew resistant, for instance, uh, you can see PMR next to varieties. Um, where that where that resistance is available, if if the if the variety is acceptable in your market, you're going to save a lot of money. That's that's the cheapest form of disease control is, is resistant varieties. We just wish that we had more resistant varieties to more diseases. Excellent, excellent pieces of advice. So we have um, this is a fun one. So a former student of yours from Iowa State is in the audience, and he's actually going to be incoming faculty at SDSU, Dr. Sean Taporic who's currently wrapping up at Colorado State. And so he's curious, is there any hope for increased mesotunnel rigidity for like a quick drag and drop installation, maybe adding some wheels, something something to set it up that way versus having to put all the hoops in and pin everything down. You used that John Toporek. Yep. Yeah, went to Costa Rica with that guy. Hi, Sean. Good yeah. To see you. <laughs> uh, he's had a really good, uh, really good uh, education uh, through the cucurbit world and elsewhere, obviously. Um, drag and drop. You know, there's so many variations, Sean, on these tunnel morphologies, as you know. Um, the next step up here would be what more people would probably think of as caterpillar tunnels. Um, but then you have the question of... Um, Where am I, when, when am I gonna be, when am I gonna service this thing? You know, if it's too heavy, I can't move it. Um, you know, I'm thinking about things like, uh, like uh, high tunnels that are, that are, that they are movable, right? They're on wheels. People do this back and forth when they make lettuce, uh, grow lettuce, you know, they'll, they'll <coughs> have high tunnels that will be on wheels. And I've seen people try to work those sometimes and, and sometimes they're, they're a little bit frustrating to work with. And I'm thinking about that in the context of, of, um, of mesotunnels. I think your problem, Sean, is going to be uh, is going to be in the in the in the down in the down road direction. You have no stability there at all. So if you're talking about rigidity, where would it come from? You, by the time you've redesigned that, you've got something more like a caterpillar or a, a high tunnel, something with with rigidity down row. Yeah. I mean, there's some advantages to Mesotunnels, you can pick them up and move them, but um, that's also a disadvantage, right? I mean, that, that you know, you have to reassemble them somewhere else. Um, but drag and drop, um, I think the ag engineers are really good partners here. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they think about these things sometimes with fresh eyes. If they're used to thinking about corn and soybeans and you give them this kind of problem, they, they, get, they get creative. So those are, those are good partners, I'd say, Sean. Um, so um, hope you keep working on that. Yeah. All right. So... For our last two questions, I'm going to invite Rhoda to join us. And for folks who are still with us and enjoying the Q&A, thank you so much. I am going to drop an event evaluation link in the chat. So um, please go check out the chat box, open up that link, save it. I promise there are eight questions. All of them are multiple choice except the last two. So if you don't have anything to say on those, you can just ignore them. But we'd love to hear what you think about today. Um, and I'll have a few more wrap ups, but before folks start abandoning us as we wind down questions, I would really love it if you'd fill out that survey. So Rhoda, I'm gonna let you pick the next question and maybe you and Mark can answer it together. Okay. Uh, do you know if chickens would be a good control for these pests? And I'm putting on my food safety hat here and saying, uh, you gotta be really careful about putting chickens on perhaps at the end of the season uh, so they don't overwinter? Well, th this is something that actually Christine may know more about than I do because her former mentor, uh, Ajay Nair at Iowa State, uh, uh, did a number of projects and is still doing them. I think he did the first with um, Mariah Belenke, right, uh, Christine? And uh, then uh, later he's been doing them with uh, Ann Carey, I believe, uh, looking at uh, chicken tractor sort of approaches uh, where, where the... Uh, uh, chickens are are moved around in a mobile um, a chicken house, and they 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 um, consume insects, and they will you know do a nice job where you put them down. Um, I guess the I haven't seen, and and I'm not I'm not versed in this area uh, 
uh, Rhoda, because you're you're in a kind of an interdisciplinary area there between the animals and the plants and the and the uh, pathogens. And um, I haven't seen uh, data that uh, bears on the question of how economically viable that is. But if one has chickens, one has a big chicken business, and one wonders how to get more um, value out of the chickens. And of course, they you know produce fertilizer at a pretty regular rate as well. Um, and you're in an organic setting, um, I can see that that would be a tempting thing to explore. But I think the growers are going to have to educate us on that one. Yeah, and uh, um, with the price of eggs right now, you might not have to worry about it. But <laughs> you know. um, somebody comments that chickens will eat everything, plants and bugs. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, well, but there is that. Chicken. You know, I mean, you have to have a discerning chicken. You know, that doesn't uh, doesn't disturb <laughs> right. it. You want to be really careful with melons because they can pick up pathogens really easily, as we've learned in the past. With well, yes, that's, that's, that's an issue too, you know, and uh, there was a time in apple orchards uh, when uh, sheep were sent into apple orchards in the fall to graze the leaves out because uh, the leaves hold a lot of pathogens uh, that, mm -hmm. that can be a problem in the spring, like apple scab. Uh, but the problem was if you didn't watch the sheep, they'd start eating the bark off the trees and that was bad. <laughs> so Rhoda, I know you, you're going to be our wrap up question. You had a curiosity for Mark. <laughs> well, it, this comes from my experience of uh, training some small row covers in my garden and trying to keep out the bean beetles. And I inadvertently made a very nice home for the bean beetles who were coming up from the soil and were now protected from any <laughs> parasites or uh, predators. And so uh, if you're, presumably if you're doing a good rotation, that would not be a, a consideration, but but I wonder if that might be a possibility. I'm glad you brought this up, Rhoda, because this is a real motivation for rotation, right? Because if you have beetles coming up, the bad beetles coming up in there, so you, you have basically have a beetle zoo and they're protected, <laughs> they're protected from predators. I'll give you another example of things that can happen under protection. Um, one time in Kentucky, um, they had a large field um, in a dry year um, that uh, just before harvest, um, um, these uh, not field mice, but what are these little, uh, uh, you know, lined uh, ground squirrels, you know, squinnies came through uh, in their protected, uh, got under the, got under the nets and, and bit holes in every melon because they were thirsty, you know, there wasn't anything to drink. So they, mm -hmm. they basically destroyed their marketable yield under these tunnels. So one thing we do um, is try to figure out um, uh, even an organic setting, how can we discourage um, uh, uh, mice and other rodents from getting in these tunnels near harvest because they smell the stuff, they come in. You know, you don't have a lot of options in, in the organic world, but snap traps um, work. So I, I think people who use these tunnels, particularly for something sweet like muskmelon, really need to be conscious of rodents around harvest. So I'm glad you brought that issue up of other things that can happen, you know, because um, I, obviously barriers can work different ways that sometimes you don't want. We have a producer who tries to trap uh, bull snakes and puts them in underneath her oh, eye tunnel. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, I hope you don't have workers in there at the same time. That'd be <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a biological control. <laughs> well, Mark, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise and kind of transitioning to podcast style and answering all of our questions tonight. We really enjoyed it. For folks who, um, you know, have more questions and want to learn more about um, gardening and have in-season growing tips, we do have a program called Garden Hour. It runs every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Central for one hour from May through August so that you can see folks like myself and Rhoda Burroughs and experts like John Ball talk about all sorts of in-season topics and you can get your questions answered. Um, we are going to have a one-off special edition garden hour on February 14th, so you'll get to see several of us on that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't remind you all to please join us on Thursday um, this week, same, same time, same Zoom link, 
and we're really excited to host Jordan Scheibel from Middle Way Farm in Iowa, and he's going to be talking about a lot of lessons learned and tactics for weed management strategies, especially for organic farming. So it's going to be a nice segue. We're going to, we went from organic disease management to organic weed management. And again, if you have future topics or feedback on um, you know, ways we can improve or things you liked. We love to hear all of the above. So please do fill out the event survey. And again, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. And everyone, please subscribe to the current Cucurbit and check out their website and see all of those um, great resources that are there to help you improve your farming endeavors. So um, thank you for the invite. Yep. Thank you thank so you much. Well. Bye now. And many thanks to my co-host, Dr. Rhoda Burroughs, who's based out in Rapid City and You'll be seeing more of us, everyone. So we look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Have a wonderful evening. I know.